sisters, my name is Blue, and today we are lost in Homestuck Epilogue Meet, Chapter 16, through wherever we leave off. Okay, into it. <laughs> when I was a child, I wrote a novel. Rose is speaking with her eyes closed. She is weary, but standing for now, near one of Dirk's work tables. She has both hands resting on the chassis of his recent project, Sawtooth 3.1. The energy humming inside its mechanical heart warms her, w warms her palms. Warms her palms. Dirk snorts, but in a good-natured sort of way. That's the closest he usually gets to laughing. Another one of those Lalan childhood wizard fix, I presume? He leans his elbow on the table and stares at her over the rims of his shades. The weight of Dirk Dirk's scrutiny is potent. She looks away. <clears throat> Compliancy of the learned. Ah, the wizard fic then. Yes. Of course, it was nothing like the polished masterpiece penned by the middle-aged version of myself in your world. Nor did the saga span as many volumes. Thirteen-year-old Rose only managed to draft the one. It changed me to say, how pathetic. I know. Rose steps back, trailing her fingers over the rivets that line saw to 3.1's chest. Eyes closed again, she passes in front of the window. With the sunset behind her, she's shadow ringed in yellow light that turns white at the tips of her hair. Though I must say, in defense of young Rose's literacy integrity, literally, lit literary integrity, having a great time already. Having carefully studied all volumes of the Elder's work and then revisiting my youthful preteen scribbles of passion, I observed more power and emotion in a single ragged notebook than a full span of the best selling series. <clears throat> it's more raw. It betrays considerably more s sincerity than my young self was surely ever aware of stitching into the prose. It meant something. Hmm. She turns to look at him. For all its plainly evident amateurism as the liter literary product of a child, I've come to believe it's a much stronger work standing alone in a single volume, its meaning and symbolism potently compressed, and its message shining through more nakedly undisguised by the cleverness of a more seasoned writer. But the basics are the same as the series you've read. The plot concerns the mechan me me mechanist mechanicians of, a of twelve wizard children. They revolt against the compliancy of the wise, kind wizards and go on to become responsible for great evils. It isn't their intent to commit atrocities or within their nature to do so originally. They become corrupt by an overabundance of knowledge, the kind never meant for the mortal mind to grasp. Yeah, this sounds pretty close to my rec recollection of it. It certainly wasn't the most fucked up thing I've ever written, but it was the most psychologically potent. Hey, Peaches. The most personal, easily. But the personal aspect to it were all telegraphed through allegory and esoteric symbolism. I wrote it in what would be best described as a fevered haze, as if I were pulling inspiration from beyond myself, channeling the history rather than channeling the story rather than writing it. You can almost call the process she runs a hand through her hair, fanning it into a halo that's suspended from the air suspended in the air for a moment, trailing spider webs of gold that dissolved into dust. She's smirking now, just a little. Enlightened. That sucked. Yes. It also sounds like the what it's the opposite of what's going on. Sounds more like you're trapped in some sort of dire creative fugue state causing you to chart your own mental profile using metaphor revolving around murderous, omniscient children. Well, considering the pun rescind- consider- consider the playful pun rescinded. 
Apologies for diminishing your presence with my suboptimal health and the troll it toll it has taken on my word word word, word play. God damn! <laughs> Thanks. It's been very difficult for me. You've been a real trooper. Anyway, my point is that I've long suspected my story was a pre-manifestation of my seer of light powers, and I was seeing beyond my universe into another. My original thesis with the with my original thesis was that the children represented the twelve trolls who created our universe. But over the years, I've come to see how malleable any apparent fact of numerological significance can be. Adaptable, actually adaptable to shifting circumstances, change in settings, stakes, and allied en ensembles. Twelve. That's how many players went through the door at the end of our game. Exactly. My friends and yours, as well as Kanaya, Karkat, Terezi, and Kellyope. Dirk settles in against the wall beside Rose, shoulder to shoulder. She seems to take some measure of comfort in f physical proximity. She finds herself leaning against him. Probably without thinking about it, Dirk imagines, because neither of them really do that. He doesn't pull away. If it's her, it's alright. He won't begrudge her small weakness now. You describe this as a fact of numerological significance, which makes it seem you suspect these correlations are something less than utterly provid providential, as if there is a... There is a part of you holding on to the belief that certain figures are coincidental, that their significance and repetition smacks of bullshit. Do they not smack of bullshit? They smack of a bunch of things, and a bunch of other things that also happen to smack of bullshit. But the network of relations isn't perfectly traceable, nor can they all be mapped on <clears throat> a one-to-one -one basis. It's unclear exactly which things are smacking, just as it's unclear that when it comes to bullshit, whether or not smacking actually describes of what it's done per se. <clears throat> Rose looks up to Dirk, a ghost of a smile that she's inherited from him. Her face, its blankness, is as enigmatic as the Mona Lisa's. Could it be that it is you who is smacking of bullshit? Dear father. Nah, I snap. I smack of um, many admirable qualities, as well as keen insights. She doesn't seem to have another ret post in return, but her gaze lingers. She stares into his shades as if convinced she could see past them. Dark allows their eyes to meet. I'm just saying it's all evidence of grand design. An immortal metatextual apparatus beyond our kin that we can only catch through glimpses of when we're provibly hmm. <laughs> shitting our brains out through our nose, which both you and I know, which only you and I know, apparently, which is precisely my question. The gaze drifts towards the ceiling. In my story, all twelve of the disciples fell victim to the varieties of power. They were filled with the light of knowledge, and one by one they succumbed to it, turning insane or evil or, most often, both. If this is the effect unchecked powers have on players living in post-canon victory state, then why isn't it affecting any of our other friends? Well, I got a few theories. She shoots him a look. It's the kind of it's the kind of look Kanaya gives her sometimes. Only a few? I mean, some of us have stopped using our powers completely. Not a whole lot of need for emergency resurrections or complex timeline manipulation on a planet that's never had a conflict more serious than sports ball riot or a rumpled hat shortage. But even aside from how often they're used, some powers don't lend themselves to the infinite expansion of one's mind the ways ours do. I see. So what you're saying is, it's more a matter—it's more a matter of one's aspect than it is whether one's powers are practiced further or allowed to a trophy. 
Yep. In that case... Rose sways suddenly. In that case, perhaps Trezzy had the right idea. Getting away from this place, I mean. Maybe I was a fool for imagining we could settle down here. She jerks away from the wall in a tortured ragdoll motion, one hand snapping out vainly for something to brace herself against. She staggers forward a bit. Dirk doesn't reach out to steady her. Anyone else would have an empathic reflex to do so. Maybe it says something about him that he lacks this reflex, and maybe it says something about Ro Rose that she prefers it this way. Try as she might to convince herself otherwise, through marriage vows and occasional banter about adoption with her wife, she is still a solitary creature. She gasps, sucks breath down her throat, and squeezes her eyes shut so hard that a tear rolls out. Tear rolls out. She slides back down the wall, sitting on the floor to save her energy. She's mostly composed when she raises her head. There's a bitter laughter at the edge of her words. How... How are you handling this so well? I assume it has... I assume it was just a fiend strider's stonism, but you seem to be taking this... In stride. Ugh. I won't lie. It's definitely making me feel pretty crazy. Dirk stands over her, adjusts his hair, crosses his arms. He makes no motion to bother joining her on the floor. He looks very together. He says the word crazy with the same in initiate in <laughs> in tonitation, which what he might say good morning. It's hard to believe he means it at all. But I've got more practice at this than you do. I've spent most of my life before the game multitasking my entire fucking sub not subconscious subnautica <laughs> that's a game <laughs> subconsciousness I've had several times my age on paper to contemplate these mysteries years of prying open can after can of worms filled with answers I don't like cut yourself on the edge more than once and you stop getting surprised by all the blood I see Rose wraps her hands around her upper arms, like there's a winter chill rattling through the workshop. She shivers. <laughs> no, don't highlight things. Okay. It's not the headache that concerns me most. In fact, I don't think it's the expansion of my powers that is causing the headaches, but rather my own resistance to it. Sometimes I get this feeling that I could, if I really wanted to, just let go. It would be as easy as opening my eyes. It's like that feeling you get when you're far enough out of a dream to be conscious in it, but not yet awake. I'm caught in a liminal space between ra reality and reverie, where people once believed demons dwelled. But the only reason the demon is still sitting on my chest is because I refuse to banish it. All I would take is looking directly at it. I'm forcing myself to stumble through my life as a sleepwalker. All this pain and sorrow could go away if I just allowed myself to wake up. Then why don't you? Because I'm not sure that the person opening her eyes will be me. Her voice is lost at sea, swallowed by the swell of darkness lurking in her imagination. This time, Dirk does reach out to steady her. He kneels in front of her, curls a knuckle under her chin, and lifts her face up to his level. Then, in a deliberate motion, he pulls off his shades. I understand completely. Rose's eyelids flutter heavy. She's met with the intensity of his naked gaze aloofly, like she's not aware of this is the first time he's ever let her see it. Hmm? I know I sound pretty nonchalant most of the time. But, actually, I'm scared shitless of myself. I've always had this uncanny ability to chart a course from A to Z and not give a fuck about any of the letters in between. I'm not sure anyone should be allowed to have that much foresight, especially a guy like me. What upsets me the most, I think, is the distance this is all pitting between me and everyone I know. Above for the further above the board you fly, the harder it gets to care about the pieces. I hear you. And personally speaking, things usually don't work out for the best when all those pieces do exactly what I say. 
things usually work out the best. So, I am also probably not the kind of guy who should get to be right all the time. Rose laughs softly. She's not, a, she's not scared of the abyss she's staring into at all. She doesn't even think to look away. There's really not an inch of humility in you, is there? I've just spent a lot of time in my own head. Maybe absolute self-absorption is the in inevitable outcome when the self is all you've ever known, when you're drowning in it. I know there's plenty of things... Where was I? I lost my place. There it is. I know there's plenty of things that suck about me. No point feigning humili humility about things that don't. And yes, I may be a shitty human being, but as mechanic, as a mechanic, I'm fucking off the charts. Rose's eyes have grown distant, almost mirror-like. Dirk can see himself reflected in her vacant stare. All the pieces in her place. The mechanisms all running smoothly. She says this in a hollow tone. It's the disarming voice a puppeteer ventriloquizes. Ventriloquizes. Vent. Vent. I can't say that word. <laughs> ventriloquizes for a marionette. Her head falls toward her shoulder slowly. Dirk catches her cheek as she slides into sleep. It's difficult for the untrained ear to spot the exact moment their conversation exact moment in the conversation with the words she was saying stopped being hers and started being his. Or maybe they were her words. Does it really matter? In many respects, they're basically the same person, aren't they? Oh god. Ah! <laughs> Kindred spirits and blood and perspective, the master puppets and res res respective games they like to believe they're playing. But you already knew that, right? <laughs> Those are some heavy implications! <laughs> oh, it's all orange now. Oh, are we reaching the end? I already have a hard time reading Dark Signs because of the bright orange against the bright white, but I guess we're doing a whole entire chapter of this. None of my friends have noticed it yet, but you have. You have the ability to read between the lines, to understand that our lives are blighted by the by this undercurrent of subtext of narrative significance. Anyone paying attention could have guessed by now who's really telling the story. You're not so innocent either. I've got you leering at some pretty personal moments. Are you having fun being a voyeur? Just violating the shit out of everyone's privacy? Are these teenage romantic entanglements panning out the way you want it? They never do. Maybe it helps being able to see everyone's thoughts described in plain sight, broadcasting the internal conflicts, the compromises, the doubts. Does it make it easier for you to accept the emotional falterings, the missteps, the basic inability to reach out and seize opportunity for happiness repeatedly dangled in their faces. Knowing their dots are transcribed by a third party, does it fill you with a sense of unease, of sickness, sensing that the observation made of their mental interiors may be tainted? Who do- who the hell do I think I am? I can hear you wondering. You know who I am, of course. The better question is, who do you think you are? What exactly is so special about you? Nothing, of course. I'm specific. I have a name, an agenda, a vision. I am a monolith of concentrated narrative authority, relaying events to you and swaying them to see, swaying them as I see fit. Whereas you are pointedly non-specific. Specific in the return, the wrath of the word specific. Returns again. <clears throat> you are the generalized and potent witness to all of this. You are essentially as beholden as me, beholden to me as those whose lives I've described. I even have the I the ability to decide what you actually mean. I can take the you-ness away from you and put it into 
pitted inside another passive mark, such as John Egbert. You didn't even notice when I did that. When I did it. And you had no objections then, so why would you object now? <coughs> mm, dying! So, what makes John so special? The answer is something I'm sure you suspected all along, but would rather not face, which is probably nothing. He isn't special. He's quite ordinary. <coughs> I should have brought my drink over here. <clears throat> I assure you, boring. Even... Boring, even, and getting less interesting by the minute he is forced to confront the absolute lack of heroic purpose except as a pawn to be manipulated by the fatalistic reality. <coughs> mm. But I also like to make it clear, he's not even that remarkable in his unremarkableness. He is simply convenient for it. Anyone can be endowed with this you-ness. If... I think it achieves a certain goal, even if the objective is merely demonstrated to the Gambit's potential to reveal an, the effortlessness behind it, to make a show of who matters, who doesn't, and even if they do matter, for how long and for what purpose as dedicated solely by the allocation of this Fal Faltry? Falsity? Mm -hmm. Eunice can be stripped from the lowly Egbert just as easily as it was given, and then bestowed upon the mighty secret, but even then only long enough to dismiss the vain, glorious spotlight hog from the narrative forever. Good riddance. But I haven't revealed myself to you just to boast about the abilities arising from the gradual obliteration of the constraints of my consciousness. I've only taken a moment to answer a few questions, not ones I've heard you ask, because again, you are non-specific, and therefore do not matter, but ones I imagined you asking. And by imagining these questions become less fake. They became less fake, and as such, demanded similar non-fake answers. No, in truth, the time has come to make my presence known in order to start bringing my plans into fru fru fruition. Time to get down to fucking business. John needs to wake up. Is it just gonna be- Just gonna be orange from now on! Yep. <laughs> My poor eyes. Okay. We can do this! Epilogue 4! When did we get on epilogue 3? I don't remember. <laughs> you wake up. What? What? You open your eyes. Actually, you're not sure if they're open. Everything is intolerably bright like it was inside the juju, but worse. Did you go blind? Are you dead? Is your ghost dead? It's been a couple seconds smiling through your miserable worst case scenarios, but then you see it... But then you see it. Your own blood, floating, floating around you in nimbus of shiny top bubbles. You reach out to touch one and it bursts around your finger. You finally process the true magnitude of what has happened. The furthest ring has been completely destroyed and you're all alone. Everything hits you at once. The light, your memories of the battle, the untethered sensation of weightlessness. It's a hammer stroke that hits you in the center of the head. It's, it splits like rivers through your gray matter. That pain and disorientation goes all the way down to your throat and you double over and... Well, you're vomiting up everything in your stomach. Rest assured, it's pretty gross. And I don't think anyone needs an explicit amount of the way you're disgorging your entire gut in zero gravity or the way it's coating your entire torso and puke from your long blue hood to your y to your silly yellow slip-ons. You seriously need to get it together. You look like an absolute shit right now, my man. In fact, you really should consider issuing an apology for the mess you're making. I'm... I'm sorry. Who are you talking to, dude? Nobody's around for miles. Everyone's dead. Well... Almost everyone. 
but certainly the vast majority of what qualifies as everyone in your current frame of reference. Every single person and every single thing nearly literally has been sucked into that monstrous black hole up there, including every single fragment of black empty space that used to provide the canvas for this bleak conund- conundrum? 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 And most of your friends, Rose, Dave, observe absurd Dave- Cat Dave, and hundreds of ghosts who all violently valiantly contributed to a victory which you're only now beginning to question the functionality functional necessity of functional necessity that that doesn't sound like something I would think because it's not what the fuck you finally notice no not me you're going back to ignoring the fact that I'm the voice in your head you've noticed how it hurts to breathe you suddenly remember, Lord English's tooth is in, is still embedded into your chest. You panic, wrap your hands around the base and give it a little tug. It's excruciating. The tooth makes an awful grating sound as it grinds along one of your ribs. You gasp and lose your grip, biting the inside of your mouth so hard that you taste blood. Can't blame me for trying, but I wouldn't do that over you. Without someone to administer proper medical care, you'll bleed out. You'll bleed to death pretty much instantly. On the other hand, the tooth is poisoned, so you're pretty much fucked either way. And that's really all there is to say on the matter. <sighs> you sigh a painful resignation and wonder what to do next. English is dead, so you suppose you can go home, right? It's tempting. You consider zapping back to Earth Sea, being done with the nightmare for good, and never breathing a word of it to anyone ever again. But you can't yet, can you? Why not, you wonder? What's the harm? You're right, it would probably be har a harmless decision in the grand scheme of things. Certainly the easiest thing to do. But what about your friends? You saw Rose and Dave die with your own eyes. You saw countless ghosts getting swallowed whole by a ferocious singularity. How about Jade, though? She could still be out there somewhere, injured, alone, scared. It's your fault, isn't it? It's... It's all my fault. You decide no matter how terrible you feel, you should look around first before you leave. You were the one who dragged her here. You owe her at least that much. Plus, there's someone else in your mind, isn't there? You proceed to wander for a long fucking time. Time passes differently here than it does for everyone else. Here, I simulate it for you. I just left to go take a piece. Pit. A piece. A piss. Then I microwaved myself a hot pocket. Then I came back. In the time it took me to do that, you just spent hours drifting around the entire circumference of a black hole thinking sad sack thoughts about the years of inaction that led you to this point, intermediately humming the Ghostbusters theme to yourself. Intermittently. You got so worked up about one of your GB freestyles, you almost missed it. There. 11 o'clock. Did you see it? It's that tiny dot floating over there. Huh? You scramble to catch it before it drifts any closer to the event horizon. Got it. What the hell? It feels familiar, but you want to make sure you're not imagining. A wallet? Your dad's wallet. You chew your lip and press your fingers into the soft leather. leather. Space is an infinitely large expanse, and a wallet is a tiny, insignificant object. Sure, there have been crazier coincidences in the course of this wacky adventure you've been having in the past for the past ten years, but this one feels more precisely aimed at your heart. You take a deep breath, unfold the wallet, and open it. Nineteen. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Yeah, we're all nineteen. Hmm. And it's only been thirty minutes. Anyway, back to plot B. Back to the B plot. Mm, good job. Good reading. 
This orange is burning my eyes. Right about now, Jade should be wrapping up her political presentation to Roxy and Calliope, using a lot more graphs and few, far fewer words than Dave did when roping her into the election. Her approach is definitely more heady, but it is also more accessible. Jade's got this disarming combo of head in the clouds, flightiness, and the kind of legit down-to-earth creed that can only be earned by having done something like cutting open your own god grandfather and stuffing him with full of polyurethane foam. Oh. So, you see, Jane's neo neoliberal austerity measures. Roxy grows upon hearing the phrase neoliberal hmm, neo austerity measures. For no less than a third of the time in this third time in this presentation. As I outlined here in graph 2 B and B2, and here in figure A6, and here in this very spooky drawing I dedicate to Kelly. Great drawing, but by the way. <laughs> such a cute face. Will no doubt lead to a whole bunch of ugly so societal black backlashes. Not just economic terms, but on a number of other more serious versities that we've been lucky enough to avoid on New Earth so far. You don't say. I do say. <clears throat> the thing is that Jane is an established establishment leader. She's looking for doing things the way our old universe did them. She's pretty convinced that she's going to be able to replicate the capitalist hierarchies that Earth's had, but in a more responsible way. But none of that stuff actually worked. And you think Carcat can do better? Can do better? I think it's worth to give him a chance. He is a leader of the people, and he's experienced firsthand what happens when an establishment goes too far. Which, I imagine, you can sympathize with. <clears throat> Jade takes a deep breath, panting a little. Her graphs are floating around the living room in disarray. She spins them around her, guiding her hands through the air like a conductor, there f before folding the pages together and shrinking them into pocket size. And that's my pitch. Roxy and Calliope exchange, exchange a look. I'm going to get us tea and snacks. Would you like some, Jade? Oh. Yeah, sure. Any preferences? Um, pumpkin matcha if you have it. Of course. I'll be right back. Kelliope excuses herself from the conversation and flees to the kitchen, seemingly making no attempt to disguise the fact that she is in fact fleeing. Jade deflates as she watches her go, sensing that her presentation wasn't a slam dunk she was hoping for. So... What do you think? Hmm. Well, I gotta say, this has been a hella convincing argument, all in all, but I don't know if I can help you out. What? Why not? Roxy presses her lips together, then bounces her palm on her knees. Her gaze slides east, then out the window. She and Calliope live in a belfry above New Prospect. One, in one end of their living room has an oriole window that looks out over a public park. The other disappears into an arcading hallway lit by the far end of a giant stained glass window that Calliope made herself. <clears throat> the corbios supporting it have windy abstract shapes carved into them. Oh, oh, too far. Too far. Way too far. This room reminds Jade of her childhood home, except that it's bright and warm and not inhabited in all corners by quirks and ghosts. That's why she can't settle down. That's what keeps Jade Harley flitting from couch to couch, relationship to relationship. She can't thinking she can't stop thinking to herself that home comes awfully close to rhyming with alone. Home is John, who doesn't call it anymore. Who doesn't call anymore. Home is when Ro Rose and Kanaya welcome her on a cold night and help her set lyrics to her sick bass lines. Home is here. 
snorting at Roxy's irre mm, irreverent method of storytelling and admiring Kelly's art. Home is Dave and Carcat, especially Dave and Carcat. Jay knows this election is important for a number, number of reasons, but let's not mistake her enthusiasm for some kind of human humanistic altruism. This girl's got personal reasons for doing all this. Jade drifts down to sit cross-legged on the couch beside Braxy. She stares at her with the dog's expression, eyes wide, head lolling to the side, until she gets an answer. I just don't really care about politics that much, I guess. Roxy turns to face Jade again, smiling apologetically. Also, this election is is all kinds of personal. I mean, if I came into your house and asked you to make some grand political whatever against your BFF, wouldn't you be all, oh yeah, totes sign, would you be all, oh yeah, totes sign me up, sign me the fuck up. I'm all about showing, sowing of discord among my childhood friends. <sighs> Let me guess. Dirk got you to got to you first. Not even. I got no problem Dirk telling Dirk where to stick it, LMAO. But Dirk's not the one running. Ow. You think he's not the one pulling the strings behind the scenes? I'm sure. Sure, but give Janie a little credit. She's got more moxie and ambition with her pinky than the rest of us got together. She's been plan planning this for a year, but she's, you know, ruthless. <clears throat> Roxy frowns. Jade is being pretty unfair. Fragile. She's gotta be Miss Perfect all the time for the billboards and press meetings. Always wearing those power suits, trying to look like a big head bitch. Like a big bad bitch. You mean, like, the contents? Wow, ouch. I'm not just imagining it though, right? You see it too. Not to dredge up something horrible from your history, but her whole image is just kind of... Woof. Is that what you guys think? You and Dave and Carcat? Well, yeah... Roxy leans forward and stares Jade down, like she's searching for something behind Jade's eyes. Jade unwittingly responds in, in kind, looking for meaning behind Roxy's gaze. But she comes up empty, and to be honest, so do I. In the spirit of full disclosure, Roxy's the only one left I haven't been able to crack. Her mind remains a total enigma. There we go. To me. Just like it always has. But... If I had a guess, it's her void powers that make her invisible, even to increasingly omniscient parties such as myself. For all those, for all those, for all intents and purposes, it's like her thoughts don't exist. She's the same person as far as I can tell. She still wears her heart on her sleeve, but the bottom line remains, Roxy Lalonde is still utterly fucking inscrutable. Well, Jane's not perfect. Roxy shrugs and runs a hand through her hair, which has been recently cut shorter than usual. And I don't know if she'll be a good president, but she's not Betty Crocker. And I love her, and I don't want to hurt her feelings, and that's pretty much all there is to say on the matter. Callie Oak returns from the kitchen with three cups, a handmade teapot, and some candied cakes. Jade finally relents. Fine. I understand. Callie, what about you? Callie Ops sets down snacks and brushes Jade's skirt aside so she can sit. Jade's skirt aside so she can sit down. She puts a claw to her mouth and makes a facial expression more complicated than you think a skull should be capable of. Oh, I'd rather stay uninvolved, thank you. Mm. I feel like interfacing interfacing with in politics and a personal argument between my friends would be impolite as well as kind of stressful to be honest. Yeah, sorry Kelly, I probably shouldn't have put all, put all that on you. Less apologizing, more snacking. Kelly claps her hands together. It's a bright noise. Her tone of voice is bright too. 
all these years, she can, and she still can't believe that she has so many friends. She smiles at Jade, and Jade smiles back. The tea tastes great. The cakes are even better. Kelly's an artist in things she does. Like, wow, Kelly, you're such an amazing hostess. <laughs> Roxy, you're so lucky to have her. Roxy giggles awkwardly. She, she gives Jade a gentle jostle and elbow to the ribs and lowers her voice. Psst. It's her. It's not her. Them. Oh! Jade tenses up and pales, turns a wide-eyed look to Kelly, who's smiling politely. She realizes a bit too late the profoundly ins ins insensitive nature of her social messed up. Oh! She grabs one of Kelly Kelly Oak's hands. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be, uh, culturally insensitive. Have I just been stupidly calling you a girl for years like a big dumb fatty like a big fat dummy cut damn it oh no I'm such an asshole you are absolutely not an asshole I didn't mind being called a girl still I don't I still don't really I didn't mind being called a girl I still don't really mind it's not exact it's just not exactly accurate but I take comfort but I did take comfort in being a girl for a very long time. This is something I've only recently decided. Yeah! Roxy pauses, even though the tilt of her voice makes her sentence sound unfinished. She stutters out the next part. M me too, actually. You? Oh yeah, we're both a they household now. Package deal, package deal thing. Things are non-binary as fuck around here. Wait, what? Really? Yep, well, I mean, that's a probably a dumb and bad way to say it. Don't tell anyone I said it <laughs> that way, RFL, R-O-F-L. But yeah, that's about where, what's going on. Read, mind, please work with me. Roxy, seriously. Like I said, fucking inscrutable. I never would have guessed. Not that I've spent much time contemplating issues related to gender. I'm pretty secure in my expression of masculinity and... You know what? Fuck this. I don't know anyone an explanation on any sort of, on, of any sort on this topic. I'm confident with who I am, what I am, my gender, as well as my understanding of the concept. You want my honest opinion? It's fucking fantastic. Good for them. Both of them, I mean, but also both of them in a singular fashion, since each one of them can now individually be referred to as referred to by the conventionally plural word "them." I'm aesthetic for personal development, for the pers for this personal development they've embraced, for the people they are, the lack of gender they identify with, the pronouns they prefer. I've got no problem with it whatsoever, and frankly, it's fucking insulting anyone would ever imagine it otherwise. So yeah, I'm gonna allow it. Carry on. Wow, that felt good to say out loud, man. <laughs> Hell. Hell of a way to come out. It's okay, I don't want to make you uncomfortable. I know, but I am curious, if you need to talk about it, I mean. Maybe. Kelly and I have been talking about it a lot, unpacking all kinds of baggage with their alien stuff and my human stuff. So, and so I got to thinking, what even is gender? Am I right, lol? <coughs> you right, Roxy. You right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense, I guess. Jade looks at her, where her hands are folded in her lap. Bites her lips. She has her own concerns about this, her thoughts. Reasonable thoughts, I'd say, but I'll refrain from any further comment. I'm staying away from the subject from now on. So you're, uh, not doing gender anymore? Yeah, I guess not, LMAFO. L-M-F-A-O. <laughs> I mean, that was all stuff from our old universe. Why'd we even bring it here, right? Right. Calliope takes a tea cake between her two claws and eats it 
delicately, hyper aware of the horrible gnashing and snapping her powerful jaw is capable of. <clears throat> My ideas about Jin shit between b two of their claws. They take a tea cake between two of their claws and eat it delicately. Sorry, my bad. It's really not that hard. <laughs> Come on. Er. We're entirely influenced by my time watching Earth. I suppose I only thought of myself as a girl because my, um, my brother took masculinity so seriously. Quite seriously. By which I mean he became very enthusiastic about all the things it's supposedly meant to be a boy. Cherub existence is dichotomous, but not in the same way human biology is. I suppose our view of human culture indirectly influenced Alternia's development, in which in turn affected yours, and which is something I've had a lot of time to think about since we came here. It's also very circuitous. Circuitous? Mm. And arbitrary. Yeah, exactly. Like, when you think about it, so much of what Earth C thinks what boys and girls should do comes straight from the imagination of a bunch of dumb teens, which is totally fucked. Sure. Jade nods quite thoughtfully. She'd be a doggy's fucking uncle if she, if she wasn't gonna come across woke as hell about this. Truthfully, though, it was making sense to her. Eye-opening, really. Why hadn't anyone told her this was an option when she was younger? She probably, she probably would love being a day when she was t a teen. I mean, what am I gonna do? Get married and type out, pop out a hundred babies? Uh, no. Exactly. I mean, once upon a time, I guess I thought I would about that, but I don't think it's what I really wanted. I just like the idea of me and Dirk making some smart-ass awesome kids together. Because I like the idea of Dirk. And also literally no one else on the entire planet was alive at the time. But we had, we had some babies without even being consulted about it anyway, so whatever. Your kids are pretty cool. I know, right? Personally, I'm a big fan. <coughs> And like that, Jade's smiling again. The storm clouds passed so quickly in our world, you almost wouldn't have thought there was anything wrong at all. Roxanne Calliope certainly didn't notice, but there's something wrong. This time, don't notice. I... I... Jade drops her tea. The cup hits the floor and shatters. Jade, she takes a sharp breath. She's not feeling well suddenly. She's dizzy, feverish, seeing things behind her field, field of vision. A blinding flash of light, a black, perfect circle burning a hole in her eyes. She tries to stand, but her knees wobble and knock together. <clears throat> Roxy shoots out of her seat and catches her before she hits the floor. Oh shit. Is she okay? I don't know. Get a cloth from the kitchen and some water. Okay, I'll be right back. Roxy eases Jade onto the couch and checks her pulse. She doesn't look bad at all. Jade wears unconsciousness well, having spent a better part of her life napping. Mood. <laughs> Roxy slaps her cheeks lightly and says her name, begs her to wake up, but she can't hear. Jade is somewhere else right now. And we're gonna leave it off on that. Because this chapter took me way longer to get through. Because of my stupid fucking reading problems. Anyways! <laughs> That was interesting, and I'm not appreciative of the sudden orange all the time text, but we'll get through it. And what an interesting turn of events. But, um, that's it for today's stars. If you liked the video, please give it a like and subscribe if you haven't already to join our wonderful galaxy. Comment down below and I'll get back to you somewhere or another. And I will see you for our next adventure. Remember, we're all made of the same cosmic dust, so be nice. Kate, love you. Bye!